Hello, this is the Radio Geek. Here again with you again to uh, show you a little project I worked on this weekend. This is a uh, an airband receiver that I got off of eBay some time ago. Um, you just basically go into eBay and search for airband uh, radio kit and you will find various different versions of the same thing basically. Um, one of the, the major differences are there's a couple of different flavors here. Um, in this section here, on um, one of the other kits, it's basically these inductors are part of the circuit board where they're actually um, uh, just layout traces in the circuit board. This one actually has a physical inductors wound here, these coils, and then there's a couple of variable capacitors and some fixed capacitors. So basically everything in this section here these capacitors and the inductors and these variable capacitors those are already on the circuit board you don't have to do anything with those or wind them or anything like that so that's kinda cool um, but everything else here yes you definitely have to put it together um, yourself it's a kit it's a soldering kit um, I did buy the aluminum uh, case separately. I think even got it from a different seller because um, uh, the seller in the kit wasn't offering the case. So um, I did uh, I did order that separately. Um, it's it's you know for the price it's pretty neat um, with the case and the circuit board and all the parts. The two together was um, it was less than thirty dollars, like twenty five bucks. Um, for both of these like the if you just want to do the circuit and you don't care about the case it's 15 or 16 dollars on eBay so it's, it's quite amazing although I must say the you do um, kind of get what you pay for these parts are not the best uh, for instance these caps these electrolytic caps the brand name on them is Chong and uh, you know I don't know if anybody makes if there's a manufacturer called Cheech that makes capacitors but I would imagine if you had both Cheech and Chong branded capacitors in your circuit, it might go up in smoke. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, it was pretty straightforward, I guess. You really don't get instructions per se. What they give you is um, a schematic, which seems to be fairly accurate. And basically just a, um, a bill of material, basically. That's pretty much it so I just went down the list of parts on the bill of material and inserted them and marked them off when I had them done that uh, they were done they do give you this um, component locator sheet which you can it's the same as the silk screen on the board so everything is very well labeled as far as the silk screen and the and the um, piece of paper here and I just would look for the part, find them. I'd circle the part with a, uh, a highlighter, and then after I installed them and soldered them, then I'd just color them in. So that's how I kept track of um, what I had put in and, and what was left to do. Um, they did provide you with some sockets for these ICs, which is nice. However, the sockets that they provided were these which I'm not a big fan of this style socket I actually prefer these guys here with the round holes they seem to be a lot more um, robust and I just like the way the chips go in them um, I don't know what the real name for these are there's a name for these I don't know if it's um, Maxwell or something like that for this style uh, of um, socket with the round holes but it, it, they're really a lot nicer than these. There's nothing wrong with these, but I don't know, I had some of these, so I just use these instead. Oh, also, they um, put all the ICs on this foam as well, and I'm fairly certain that this is not ESD foam. I'm sure there's a lot of a static electricity with this kind of foam, so. Um, but the chips seem to for survive, so I guess that's all that's important with that. Um, uh, the other thing is when you get the uh, case, if you buy the case, it just comes with the case, top and bottom shell. The board just kind of slides in in between a, a couple of aluminum rails, so to speak. 
or channels. It comes with these plastic uh, knobs and um, it also comes with the LED and the, and the switch. Um, now to disrupt the power for your switch, what you have to do is, I don't know if this is going to show up or not because this is not the greatest schematic, but you got a protection diode here from the input of 12 volts and there is a um, ferrite bead here so what I did was I just um, didn't insert the second leg of the ferrite bead and then I put the switch between the tip of the ferrite bead and where the ferrite bead would be inserted in the board so that would disrupt the 12 volts going through the ferrite bead um, so that's how I did, uh, did my switch uh, my wire was actually too big to go in the hole for the uh, where the ferret bead went, so I actually did tack it on the end of uh, the diode, the protection diode here. Um, there are um, some different diodes in here. Um, there is um, this protection diode is like a 4001, which is your black silicon diode, and then there's a really small. Um, glass type one that's the 1N4148 and then there's a big fat one that's also glass as well and that goes in the D2 location which is your 2AP9 uh, in case anybody's wondering about that um, but between the schematic and the silk screen I think I think most people will be able to figure out what's what and uh, where to put things um, the the pots are not very good at all. They're 10k pots, but they're at least mine were. Uh, the shafts on them are kind of tilted at an angle, so they're in the circuit board perfectly straight. But if you look at the switch or the knobs and the shafts, you can see they're tilted out to to the right there, which is kind of weird. I don't know if all of them are like that or just the ones I got, but they all seem to be exactly the same. For, for whatever reason, anyway. Um, but they seem to work. It's they're very scratchy. I don't know if they're just dirty, kind of sitting around or what. But if I'm going to mess with the volume here, just you just hear the scratchiness of them. Also, uh, it this only comes with a headphone jack, so I have it going through some amplified speakers so I can hear it. So let me mess with the volume knob. And you'll see what I mean. Yeah, that's what that sounds like. And then so we got the volume here on the far right, neck closest to the um, headphone jack. And then the middle one is your squelch. And then this other one here is your tuning. And you have nowhere, no idea where you are when you're tuning. There's no scale or anything, and there's not enough room on the faceplate to to put anything because they got the switch right above it. So you really can't mark anything. And the only thing you're going to have to do when you build it, as far as tuning, is don't turn anything. Don't don't mess with those. Don't mess with that. It's the only thing that you're ever going to have to do to find the um, air band is this little guy right here. That guy right there. And you have to tune that slug either up or down and just move it a little bit then turn the tuning knob up and down the band, see if you hear anything. And you got to keep playing with it until you figure out where the, the top part of your tuning and the bottom part of your tuning, you're picking up some aircraft. So then you know you're in the aircraft band. When I first got this, I didn't hear anything. And I played with it a little bit. And then I was picking up uh, two meter FM repeaters and some police at 150 some megahertz. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of surprising because uh, the aircraft band is AM, but I would still be able to, to hear that, so um, interesting. But anyway, on mine anyway, I had to basically turn this slug until the inside of that slug, that metal slug, is, is protruding out. So basically it's moving up, up, up. I had to come out quite a bit for it to be in the aircraft band when I'm tuning on the lower part and the upper part of the tuning knob to pick up stations. So that two. Twenty-six twelve, North Carolina. So long. Oh, there it goes. Um, so I had to tune it out quite a bit, or turn this out quite a bit, to be able to be in the in the aircraft band. 
Um, that's really the only thing you should have to mess with. And when you're on the aircraft band, the transmissions are really short usually. Not a big long winded thing, so it's kind of hard to adjust things. You kind of have to just turn slowly. You hear something, you stop moving. Wait a minute and see if you hear something. And it's kind of a thing. This this other uh, one here, you can turn to peak the the volume, the audio level, to get um, maximum signal. But as you can see, those transmissions are so short, it'd be awful difficult to do. So I didn't even mess with that. The only thing I messed with, you know, was uh, was that guy over there, um, just just so that uh, I could even receive the the uh, uh, the air band at all but all in all it's a pretty nice kit it's fun to fun to build um you know for the money it was cheap enough it was a nice weekend uh project and uh, all in all it's uh it's pretty good for the money i guess um the antenna i'm using is just a uh, a little uh, uh two meter 70 centimeter mag mount antenna um quarter wave so um, you don't need anything elaborate. I'm in the basement and I'm picking up airplanes, so you know that, that should be good. Uh, if you live close to an airport, you might get the tower as well. I don't live anywhere near the airport, so um, I don't pick up the tower, but just the just the aircraft itself. So anyway, um, it's available on eBay, about twenty-five dollars all total. Um, there's not really a model number or anything. Just search for Airband Receiver Kit, and you will find them. Uh, okay, hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this is the Radio Geek.